Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our scripture this morning is found in the book of Philippians. It's in the New Testament, um, and uh, it's one of the letters that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And so I'm going to ask you to turn to it. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 1, and we'll go into verse 9 in just a moment. As you're flipping to it, and I encourage you to bring your Bibles, I really do, uh, or look them up on a phone or some other device. It's amazing how we have, can have the Word of God so easily at our fingertips nowadays. What a, what a treasure that is that did not exist for thousands, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But as you're looking to it, just a little bit about Philippians and the book of Philippi. Philippi it was a, a city uh, in, in Greece, Macedonia area. Uh, it was a very important city. Um, it was, anybody ever heard of the guy named Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great's father uh, kind of made Philippi a, a really big, big thing. Uh, there was a gold mine there that provided some wealth, and it also was a strategic place with all of the Asian uh, trade routes that would go through there as well. We see uh, a lot of the key characters that many of you may have heard from Shakespearean drama, like Julius Caesar, Brutus, Cassius, Cleopatra. Um, all of them have ties to uh, Philippi. And after, um, after Mark Anthony uh, was, was uh, destroyed, uh, he and Cleopatra, then uh, um, Octavius, the governor, became known as Augustus, and he built up uh, Philippi, and he actually filled it with a bunch of uh, former military folk, a bunch of veterans. Doesn't sound anything like Oromocto, does it? Uh, <laughs> filled the community with a bunch of veterans that were faithful and loyal to Rome, and this is the, um, this is the population of Philippi at the time that Paul is writing uh, to these folks. But Philippi is important to the New Testament and to us as well. It has some amazing themes in this letter to the Philippians, but it was a very important place for Paul because a couple of people that um, had a very important part of Paul's life uh, were the forming people of this church. Lydia was one of the people that came and heard the gospel. We hear both her and Acts. When, after she came to faith, her household came to faith. And as well, Paul and Silas at one point were in prison and they were praising God and the chains fell off of them and the jailer was struck. Anybody remember hearing that story? The jailer was struck and the jailer thought about killing himself because he couldn't believe that Paul and them were, going, were, were set free. That jailer came to faith and that jailer and his family also um, started the early church in Philippi. So Paul has a really close tie to the Philippians, and it's a really, um, it's a really, it, it's almost like a love letter that Paul is writing to the Philippians. He doesn't rip them apart. He doesn't, uh, this isn't a get your act together letter. This is more of a, you know, I thank you, and I praise God for you, and you've done so much for me, and they sent an offering to help out in the ministry. And Paul is writing to them, and he's, he's just writing some encouragement to them. Uh, so here's what it says in Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9. If you haven't found it in that time, you're never going to find it. Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9. <laughs> Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and I long for uh, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. We're coming near the end of the, um, the series on uh, No Longer, 
And I want to finish off with um, a, the calling that God places on our lives as new believers is that we are no longer complainers, but he calls us to be worshipers. So to be no longer a complainer, but to become a worshiper. No one wants the label of a complainer, do we? None of us, when they say, well, describe yourself. And I say, well, you know, I, I, I live in Oromocto West. I work for the military, and I'm a complainer. Like, <laughs> nobody self-identifies as a complainer. That's not a badge of honor that we wear. It's, uh, it's rarely recognized, even by ourselves. And the truth is, complainers get on people's nerves. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hey, men, they even get on... God's nerves. We see that in Exodus chapter 16 where God brought the people out of slavery in Egypt by an amazing amount of miracles at great cost. He brought them through. He parted the Red Sea. He brought them through and he provided food for them every day out of nowhere. He provided manna for them. And his people started going, I want meat. I want quail. I want food. Do you remember back when we were in slavery? It was so good back then. What? You want meat? I'll give you meat. He gave the meat, and then they didn't take care of the meat, and then they all died from the meat. It was just, it was a, but it just infuriated the Lord. We see um, in in the accounts um, in Exodus 16, just infuriated them how how ungrateful and how complaining they were in their nature. And what He desires of us, and I think what we should desire of ourselves is to be the opposite of a complainer. And from what I understand from Scripture, the absolute opposite of a complainer is a worshiper. One says, I don't have enough, nothing's good, nothing's terrible, to, boy, wow, and in Christ, in God, what have I received? Thank you, God. One says, thank you, and one says, eh, not good enough. So, I think in Philippians chapter 4, as Paul is writing to his friends in Philippi, his church in Philippi, he's giving them instructions and reminders of how to live a life that is full of worship and not full of complaining. And the first thing I want you to see is this. It starts by remembering your identity. He starts in verse 1, says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this, my, in this way, my beloved. The first thing I want you to see is that in order to transform a nature that wells up naturally inside of us, that complaining nature that just exists, to start by remembering your identity. This is your reality check. So when you wake up in the morning... You need to realize that everything you have has been provided for you. Everything you have has been provided for you. We have the opportunity, our, my, my kids are back visiting us this weekend, and it's just wonderful. We're just having a great time with them. And I remember when they were younger, and, you know, when they get up in the morning and they're already cranky. <laughs> you know that? And this is before you can give them coffee. Like, they wake up, and, they're, and it's like, and you have worked all week to make sure that they have food in the cupboard, make sure their laundry is done, their bed is made, that there's no leaks in the roof. You have made sure that they have a, a complete safe environment, and you have provided for them all that they need to flourish. And the first thing out of their mouths is, I don't like this. I don't like that. And you're like, come on. Now, imagine God looking down upon you when you get up and you start to complain. Well, what has he provided for you? Right? Think about all that he's provided for you. Start with your identity in that first. What has God done for you? Because when you're complaining, you're not complaining out into a void. You're complaining out, and God hears you. And he hears what comes across as ungratefulness, doesn't it? What all has God provided for you in your identity in Christ? What more could he do? 
because to complain is to do one of two things. First of all, it is to either assume there is no God, and that's why you can complain, or worse, it's to insult God. As a child of God, we need to start with, what do I have today? Right? None of us like to wake up that way. A lot of us like to go, here's what I don't have. And we have an entire media industry and an entire marketing um, plans are out there to let you know, here's what you don't have. And if you buy this, then you'll be satisfied. It builds into that natural nature that I don't have enough. It's what led to the fall of man with Adam and Eve. You know, there's knowledge that God's keeping from you. Yeah, I don't have enough. I need more. What what happens when you realize all that you do have? It kind of bears down on us. This past week, a week ago, we were here, and we were praying for those that were in the fires, weren't we? And what have I heard this week? Awful rainy. <laughs> really? You know, like, kind of, yeah, I, I, I know they needed water for the fire, but, like, come on, like, it's awful rainy. Like, right? Like, come on. <laughs> come on. What, what do we, what do we have? Like, it, it's just, what has God provided? We prayed for rain. Rain came. In fact, there's places in the country that are still in desperate fire situations. Nova Scotia got the amount of heaviest rain in the places where there are heaviest fires. Thank you, Lord. We have, like, lawns that are really high because we haven't had a chance to mow them in the past week because of how wet it's been, right? But what has he protected us from? And the big thing, I think, when we come and we, we don't recognize our identity as, as, as people that God loves and people that... God desires for us to come into relationship with through Jesus Christ, how much he has provided for us. He has provided so much for us. How much have we been protected from that we aren't aware of? Right? That, that coating of rain that has led us to having, you know, a bit more of a wet, dark week. How, what has that protected us from? How much stuff has God protected us from? And we've got, oh, I don't really like that. I don't like that kind of protection. I'd rather have the sun and, okay? So anyway, just to be aware of that. First of all, start with your identity. Know that as a child of God, what you do have. And when you realize that, then that begins to help diminish the complaining. And it becomes smaller. The things that, that we complain about become smaller. The next thing is he tells us to choose harmony. In verses 2 and 3, we hear, and this is how we know Paul is so close to this church in Philippi. He's calling out people by name. He, he, he's, he's writing to them by name, and he says, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also, help these women who have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Now, it's hard to believe, and it's probably the only account that has ever happened in history, that's why it's recorded in Scripture, that there were two Christians at odds. I know, isn't that amazing? I am so glad they wrote down scripture because I have never encountered that. Okay, lightning is about to hit. No. It is true in the family of God that there will be Christians that are going to be at odds with each other. And we see in this passage, I went on to write verse 3 as well, because it says that these women have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel. So he's not talking about a couple of busybodies, a couple of people that sit on their hands and they just complain about everything. He's talking about two devout followers of Christ and Paul, co-laborers, searching and seeking to bring forth the good news of the gospel into their communities. But for some reason, we don't know the issue, and I thank you, Lord, that we don't because it gives us a beauty of, of translating it over a, a bunch of whole different experiences. Just like we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Since we don't know, we can apply it to all kinds of different situations. And we don't know what bee got in the bonnet of Yodia and Syntyche. We just know that they were at odds. And them being at odds broke Paul's heart. That's what we see. He, he uses the words like, I urge Syntyche. 
and I urge Euodia, right? He doesn't say, I urge you to agree with this person. He urges both people, holding them in equality, saying, I really urge you to live in harmony, to, to be together. I plead with you to come together. Do you know a parent's desire, if they have more than one child, is to see the children live together without fighting? To live together in unity? For them to get over their differences? Because it grieves a parent's heart to see their children at odds with one another. How much more for our Heavenly Father when he sees his children, whom he loves desperately, fighting with one another and, and, and getting into conflict with one another over differences. Just as I took you back to Adam and Eve in the garden, we can easily go to Cain and Abel, who the, the, the first relationship of siblings together, and, and one killed the other because they couldn't get over a difference that they had with one another. And that festers and builds inside of us. God wants us to instead care for one another, to release it, to realize it's not worth it. And not just externally. So they come together and they go, oh, hi, oh, hi. But to really work at it. Like, God, help me to forgive. Show me my error. Show me my a place where I need to give in. And also work on them as well so that we can not only just survive in a room together, but that we can actually care for one another and be restored back to the desire that you want for us. This is key, to choose harmony, because there's a whole lot of people that will tell you you don't have to. We're living in a world where it's like, oh, no, no, cancel them. And God said, oh, no, please. Paul is saying, please, I urge these folks to get together. It's worth it to work on it. The next thing we see is that in order to transform our nature from our old way into the new way is to refocus on Jesus solely. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Scripture doesn't tell us to do things that we naturally do. Scripture tells us to do things that we don't naturally do. If I vacuumed all the time, my wife wouldn't say to me, Perry, you need to vacuum. Because I've been vacuuming all the time. She doesn't need to say it to me. But if I don't, she does need to remind me. This is how scripture is often written. When you read things where it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, by the way. And again, <laughs> I say rejoice. It's like, get with it on this, okay? You need to focus on rejoicing. And by rejoicing, it says rejoicing in the Lord. Go back to Jesus, Father, Son, and Spirit. What has God provided for you? That no matter what you face, nothing can separate you from the love of God for eternity. That's what Scripture tells us. The Scripture tells us that um, all things are possible for those who believe. The Scriptures tell us that and when we go through the valley of the shadow, that he is with us, his rod and his staff that comfort us. You look through all of the promises of God. You look through what all God has done for you. And that in looking back, we remember and we find joy again in it, and it fills us with rejoicing. See, just as the complainer sucks air out of a room a rejoicer a grateful person floods life from their mouths life pours out of a rejoicing person that's grateful ever encountered a really grateful person fills you up right that's what god desires his people to be as worshipers we fill up and it overflows out of us, and it flows into others, as opposed to becoming the vacuum of complaint that just sucks from everybody, right? Scriptures tells us to do things we don't naturally do. So rejoicing in the Lord, realizing the great love that God has for us, transforming us in that. So if you find yourself starting to complain, just start, okay, what has Jesus done for me? What has Jesus done for me? Okay, okay, okay. The next thing, 
is to deliberately interact as ambassadors. He says in verse 5, Let your gentle spirit be known to all people that the Lord is near. A great privilege that you have as a Christian is that you have the role as Christ's ambassador. An ambassador represents someone when uh, they are living in a different residence. So I believe um, there's folks in our congregation that have worked in embassies throughout the, uh, throughout the world representing Canada. And when you're an ambassador, you're, you're the same thing as reflecting the nature and the persona of the one that you're the ambassador of. As Christians, the scriptures tell us that by wearing a gentle spirit for all people, that we are the ambassador of the Lord. Interesting thing about being around the military for 15 years, around, not in, not wearing the uniform, but being around the uniform, is there's things I'm learning and things I'm learning I'll never know. But there is this amazing code of conduct that is held within the military, a way of interacting and being viewed socially and being viewed publicly, right? That you do not dishonor the uniform with your actions. Am I right in that? Okay, good. Excellent. For Christians, our uniform is our gentle spirit. In seeing that gentle spirit coming from us, in seeing that nature of worshiping, coming from us, seeing that gratefulness coming from us, people should be, be able to identify and go, that's a Christian. I can tell by the way they talk. I can tell by the way they act. I can tell by the way they, they aren't complaining. That's amazing. So your gentle spirit is your uniform as an ambassador of Christ. So deliberately realize that you are an ambassador. Every time you open your mouth, Jesus is behind you in the conversation. And do you want him going, oh, Perry, no. Or do you want to bring a smile to his heart? And do you want to bring forth, you know, let him speak through you. Powerful to help you in, in breaking through those, those patterns. The next thing we see is, um, where do we go with all your frustrations and concerns? You might be hearing through here, well, never complain, because there's nothing to complain about. Everything is good. Everything's always good. It's all rosy. It's not what I'm saying. There will be things that are very difficult, things that will cause anxiety, things that will cause um, trouble. In this world, you will have trouble, is what Jesus actually tells us. We will encounter trouble. We will encounter things that overwhelm us. We will encounter things that we will want to get some support on. That's why we complain. We're, we're trying to gather support and trying to find some strength from others as we complain. Paul tells us that when those frustrations hit you, it's okay as long as you direct it the right way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Direct it to God. If things are going really, really bad and, and you are just, uh, you're overwhelmed, rather than going to the coffee shop and calling together a bunch of your buddies to complain about it, prayer meetings should be packed solid. Right? Here's where you come and bring it. Bring it to God. Come together with him and, and bring it to him. Bring it to someone that can do something about it. I've been around people in enough workplaces that have complained about the situation of their workplace. But they never tell those in authority. But they tell everybody else. Oh, this is a terrible place to work. Oh, this is awful. Oh, this is rotten. This is, well, have you told your boss? Oh, he won't listen. There's no sense telling him. It's not worth it. God, who can do something about what you're going through, wants to hear from you your frustration. Don't blab it out to everybody else. Take it to him first. He is the complaints department. Go to him. Let him hear what it is you're going through. Take it to someone who can actually help you. Otherwise, you're just reinforcing frustration. I am so heartbroken when I hear of folks that are frustrated with something in their church. 
and they tell everybody else. I, I, again, sadness in coffee shops where I sit and listen to folks from other churches, not ours because our church people are perfect, <laughs> but from other churches chatting and they're talking to one another and say, oh, can you believe they did this and they did that? And, and they're just, and they're talking to people that don't even go to their church. I'm like, oh, what a horrible, what, what's the opposite of witness? That's exactly what they're doing, the opposite of witness. Well, I'm never going to go to a church because listen to what, what they're dealing with at their church. Rather than taking those issues, because I assume those folks are Christians or at least on the path to, to being a follower, taking it to the right people, taking it to God, taking it to him and say, here's what's going on, help me. The next thing, I actually have the wrong verse here because I am not perfect. But... In verse 7, it actually says, And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's what verse 7 says, not what I have printed there. There is a promise of peace when we bring those issues to God. When we go from complaining to worshiping. When we go from saying, this mountain is so big, this mountain is so big. Do you see how big my mountain is? This mountain is so big. By going to God and saying, God, here's my mountain. And letting his peace come over us as we sang and we worshiped earlier. I'm greater than that mountain. But God, this is so huge. Like, like God, th this is my finances. I've got you. But God, but God, this is my health. I've got you. But God, this is, this is huge. This is a decision a family, making, family member is making and it could be horrible. I've got it. I've got them. I will work together all things for good for those who love me. Yeah, but you're not working out the way I want it. Just to get the peace that God is over it. That is the power to help diminish complaining. The promise of peace. Because I, here's a little rule you can stick to, and I'm even going to go in my waiting area. As you take it to God, you'll find peace. As you take it away from God, you'll find conflict. That's a rule of life. As you take it to God, you'll find peace. But as you take it away from God, you'll find conflict. Because you don't have the resources to deal with whatever it is you think, however big this problem is that you're working through. And it says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is pure, true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's anything excellent, praiseworthy, Think about these things. Um, I've been here 15 years, and those of you that know me, they, 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 have, they have watched me from this pulpit. And they've seen my weight go up and down and up and down, and hopefully it's going down soon. Um, but one of the things that uh, I've learned through the whole thing, not that I've always put it into practice, but one of the things I've learned is that um, fill your plate with veggies. <laughs> It's not enough to say you're going to diet and I'm just going to cut out everything. Well, when you cut out everything, then it just creates a hunger inside. But if you fill your plate with veggies, then you are giving life-giving things to you that are filling and life-giving and satisfying and helps you in your process so you don't live on junk food. Complaining is junk food before God. See, the truth is, is there's a lot of religions that exist out there, especially Near Eastern religions, that says, you just need to let your mind let go of everything and enter into this nirvana, enter into a place where you're not holding on to anything and, and you're just in this empty state. The scriptures actually tell us the dangerousness of, of having a, a, a cleaned, out, uh, cleaned out mind that nothing is allowed into. That, that's a place where demonics come and, and work powerfully in that. Instead, God doesn't want us to let go and just be empty. He wants us to be full of the good things. What is true? What is honorable? What is right? What is pure? What is lovely? What's commendable? What is good in this world? God wants your mind filled with what is good in this world. And when you uh, focus on that, it pushes aside those things that are terrible those things that are, are eating away at you. We have, 
fresh oxygen that we can breathe. We have water that we can drink. Already we're talking about a large amount of our population in this world that doesn't have that. We just take it for granted. Indoor plumbing, we take for granted. Does not exist in some places. What do you feel like for supper? Well, I'd like to have Greek. Maybe Italian. I don't know. We'll just get a, a microwave pizza pocket. The options that you have. The, what you have available to you. But then, focus on what, what the scriptures tell us. What's good? Like, look at the beauty of creation. Look at how empowering that is. Look at the things that are honorable, things that are just, things that are right. Think of, look at the good things that exist in this world and focus your eyes on those things. Fill your minds with that. And God gives us lots to focus on. Lots of life-giving things to focus on. Look to the Word of God. Let that fill you and empower you. It's not a matter of just letting go of those things that you complain about, but it's instead about filling your minds with things that are good and things that are helping you towards being a worshiper so that you're overflowing with His Spirit, that you're overflowing with goodness. Um, that, that's what He desires for us. And the last thing He says here, As for these things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. As I said earlier, Paul was very important in planting the church in Philippi, where Lydia and, and the jailer and their families began the, 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 to follow after the ministry. Actually, we see in Philippians 1 that it's an established church because there's bishops and elders, and, and it's actually doing quite well. But they knew Paul. They walked with Paul. They saw Paul. They saw him uh, live out the Christian faith. And the encouragement that we have from Paul to this church is the same encouragement I give to you, is that look for those that are living it out, that are models for you. Now, I'm not saying everyone is perfect. Even Paul himself would not say he was perfect. He had thorns in the flesh. He had all kinds of uh, things that he struggled with as well. But it says this, at the very, at the, at the, right in the middle of it, all these things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Practice, practice, practice. I highly doubt anybody's going to walk out of the service today and just, you know what? My desire to complain is now gone forever. Thank you, Pastor Perry, for sharing that with me. <laughs> I am freed. I can't even think of something to complain about. Not going to happen. I know that. You know that. But as you practice filling your lives with things that are good and holy, as you practice giving your cares and concerns over to God, as you practice realizing that the value of relationships is more important than that issue that I have with my fellow brother or sister in Christ, as you practice, 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 you will become stronger, 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 and you will be filled up more and more and more with those life-giving things that God desires to put into you. And please know this. You have the power... You have the power to lead somebody, encourage somebody in the Christian faith just by being a worshiper. Because you also have the power to draw someone away from Christ and diminish their faith by being a complainer. Let that ride in your mind before you open your mouths. Right? Good news. He gives you enough to fill you to overflow through you so that you can worship and find something every new every day to worship God for, to rejoice in him always. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you that you challenge us and you challenge our old nature to just complain and to whine about what we don't have. Fill us with an awareness of what we do have. And fill us with an awareness of what is yet to come as a follower of Christ that you have prepared not only this place for us, but you have prepared a place for us when our struggles and our um, challenges are over in eternity with you. Father, thank you for this family. Thank you that we get to worship you together and fill us with your spirit that just brings life to all that we encounter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.